Hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation, which is part of a series of PATH Live Forums. Uh, today's conversation is called COVID-19 Vaccine Introduction, Insights from Malaria, Meningitis, and More. And by way of introduction, uh, I'm Debbie Atherley. I'm the global head of policy access and introduction for PATH's Center for Vaccine Innovation and Access. And I'll be moderating today's conversation. We'll start just by going over a few logistics. Of course, we wanna hear from you during this conversation. So please don't hesitate to share your questions and comments with us by submitting them in the chat or Q&A box at any time throughout the discussion. I'll be monitoring your questions and I have some help behind the scenes too. And we'll have some time in the latter half of this hour uh, for those questions. Um, I'd also invite you to join the conversation online by using the hashtag pathliveforum um, and tagging us at pathtweets. Uh, the call is being recorded and will be distributed for those who are unable to attend. So I want to say a special thanks to the Exxon Mobil Foundation for their support of this Path Live Forum. Path's grateful for their partnership with us over more than 15 years in support of our efforts to develop and ensure access to malaria vaccines and for their commitment to improving health in the communities where they work. Um, I see that we have participants joining from all over the world, uh, philanthropists, government representatives, corporate partners, and our peers, uh, both at PATH and in other health organizations. I just want to thank everyone um, for all you're doing for our communities at this time. So the majority of today's discussion will be questions and answers uh, with our, our panelists and we'll have their videos up. However, if internet connectivity becomes a problem, we'll certainly adapt. All right, so just uh, by way of introduction of PATH, I wanted to share a, a little bit about us for those who may be less familiar, just a couple of slides. We are a global team um, of uh, just over 1,500 staff with a footprint in more than 70 countries. Most importantly, really our mission is around health equity so that all people in all communities can thrive. We work locally and in partnership with governments to strengthen public health in communities. We build stronger health systems, we fight infectious disease, respond to emerging health threats uh, like COVID, and uh, develop policies and a lot more. And at the global level, we advise normative bodies. Uh, we do a lot of coordination of multi-stakeholder efforts, uh, program evaluation, uh, products in the categories you see there. Uh, and then right now we are part of one of the fastest global efforts to scale up and introduce a novel vaccine for COVID-19. Um, so just a few opening remarks, and then really I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists for some important questions about this. But you know, I, this session is very timely. We're getting daily updates about the vaccines, but just yesterday, the British regulatory agency approved the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine for emergency use. And the UK is intending to begin vaccinating its highest priority populations as early as next week. So it's sort of like, here we go. <laughs> we're, we're on the brink and, and here we go. Um, and sitting in the, in the US, I think something that I, I really like to say and remind my friends and family is uh, the importance of protecting everyone in every corner of the globe protects you. And really this is the first time in history we've had to consider the concurrent global distribution of a healthcare intervention to protect the entire human race. Um, and this unprecedented undertaking inevitably comes with novel challenges 
but for us, it provides unique opportunities for innovation and equity. Um, we're applying what we know from previous experience to our response to pan this pandemic. And then we're also learning to adapt and innovate uh, when we're in uncharted territory. Uh, during today's discussion, our panelists will explore some of those lessons learned, uh, including from the world's first malaria vaccine, the HPV vaccine, and the meningitis vaccine. And I'd like to just start with a personal reflection on uh, the meningitis A vaccine, which draws some similarities and contrasts to today's COVID vaccine introduction. It's about 25 years ago uh, in the West African region, leaders were crying out for solutions to the meningitis epidemics that ravaged those communities and killed tens of thousands every time it appeared. And at that time, the global community responded by pouring resources into the development and introduction of a highly effective low cost vaccine that just 10 years ago was introduced via mass campaigns to a broad age range of from children to young adults and virtually eliminated the disease. We have so many lessons we've learned from the success story, including one, the critical importance of galvanizing all partners, everybody around a single goal, which was defeating meningitis. We had to figure out how to reach a population that wouldn't normally receive vaccines. So in that way, similar to COVID, we had to make people aware of the benefits and risks of vaccination uh, to ensure that communities knew why it was so critical and could make their own decisions about what to do in the face of the epidemic. However, COVID presents also some novel challenges to other vaccine introductions, including meningitis, in that we all have, we'll have many different vaccines, not just one, a wider array of target populations, higher levels of vaccine hesitancy or reluctance, um, unique supply chain issues. And then because of the incredible speed with which these vaccines are being developed, and the quick spread of the novel coronavirus, more unknowns about how long the vaccine will protect individuals and when we might reach a point of population immunity. Um, I'll leave this example with a quote from uh, Dr. Mark LaForce who led the meningitis vaccine project at that time when he was at PATH and worked on the development of the MENA vaccine. And he said, the world came together to create tremendous health impact with this vaccine. We need to ensure that we finish the job with MENA and apply the lessons learned to the next generation of meningitis vaccines for Africa. And I think this quote aptly applies to our COVID situation. This is an exciting time to begin rolling out a vaccine to help us control the pandemic, but we also need to be patient and persistent um, as it's gonna take a while for us to finish the job. And I think the last thing I, I just want to uh, say in, in sort of intro to this is um, an acknowledgement of a tremendous global effort to set up a framework uh, called COVAX um, that will ensure more equitable distribution, development, and access of COVID vaccines. Um, it's one of three pillars of what's called the ACT Accelerator, Access to COVID-19 Tools. Uh, and which was launched in, in April of this year in response to the pandemic. And it includes um, innovations uh, around uh, diagnostics and therapeutics as well as vaccines. Um, and the COVAX pillar is focused on vaccines, but it's really, it supports the research development and manufacturing of a wide range of candidates and the facility itself will negotiate pricing uh, for those countries uh, and those manufacturers that are involved. And I think, again, this is an unprecedented way that the world has come together to focus on um, this pandemic and ensure that we can get global access to this vaccine. Um, just in terms of numbers, uh, wave one of vaccine distribution targets about 3% of the low and middle income population meant to focus on healthcare and other frontline workers. And wave two, about 
17% of the population, which is high-risk adults, the elderly, those with compromised immune systems. So again, a tremendous effort and with the expectation that perhaps um, 2 billion doses could be distributed sometime by uh, the end of next year. So I, I think transitioning into you know, where the countries are, and you'll hear from our panelists, but again, emphasizing protecting everyone around the globe protects you. And the countries are now actively planning for distribution and administration of vaccines. Excellent guidelines have developed, been developed for countries to help them estimate their at-risk populations and ensure that everybody who needs this vaccine uh, will be able to, to get it. I think, but even with an, such an unprecedented level of cooperation, in order to ensure this vaccine reaches across the globe to all populations, we'll need to use every tool in our toolbox, not just vaccines, and lean on the vaccine introduction expertise and experiences of the past while innovating for what we have now. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about the experiences of our panelists today. So um, without further delay, I will introduce your panelists for today. So uh, Dr. Fiona Atuebe is the Regional New Vaccines Introduction Medical Officer for the WHO Regional Office for Africa. She's an experienced vaccinologist and immunization expert and currently coordinates the, the WHO's work in the African region to introduce new vaccines uh, and increase uptake of underutilized vaccines. She is currently co-chairing the WHO Africa COVID-19 Vaccine Readiness and Equitable Delivery Task Force. And I have to say, I've also had the pleasure of working uh, with her both at PATH and in this role for a number of years. So welcome Fiona. And I'll go through each speaker and then uh, we will ask questions from there. And uh, Dr. Rose Jalongo is the Strategic Information Management and Communications Officer for the National Vaccines and Immunization Program at the Ministry of Health in Kenya. Dr. Jalongo is a medical doctor with public health background. She has an in-depth understanding of various aspects of immunization programs in Kenya, including service delivery, in the context of devolution, program management, capacity building, advocacy, communications, and social mobilization, monitoring and evaluation, vaccine logistics, supply, and quality. Welcome, Dr. Jalengo. And then uh, last but not least is John Bawa. He is the Africa lead for vaccine implementation for the Center for Vaccine Innovation and Access at PATH. Uh, John also serves as a focal point in Ghana for the malaria vaccine implementation program and is the deputy director of PATH's Ghana country program. Prior to joining PATH, John served as the Ghana site project manager for the pivotal phase, phase three trial of the RTSS malaria vaccine at one of 11 sites across Africa conducting the trial. Welcome John and thank you all for being with us today. Really, really delighted to have you. Okay, so now comes question time. Um, so just trying to think about untangling some of the issues behind a COVID vaccine, about behind COVID vaccine introduction as you guys are getting ready. So Fiona, I'll start with you. Um, in your view, what will be some of the greatest challenges to ensuring that a new COVID vaccine reaches all people, especially the most at risk, including older populations, for example? Thank you very much, uh, Debbie, and uh, greetings, everybody. So the greatest challenges. We have challenges we are facing now, but we also have challenges that we are anticipating. My first, the first challenge I think about is the indemnification and liability uh, clause that we've asked countries to sign, that they do not seem to understand what they're putting the, them, what this signature that their pen is, on, is, is, is about. We are having a vaccine that we are going to roll out that has not been pre-qualified, the vaccine under, still under study like we did with the Ebola vaccine. But in particular, this vaccine is going to be introduced 
and we're asking the countries to sign that they're going to take, that, that they let free the manufacturers of that liability that could arise if there's any injury or any adverse event from the vaccine. The second um, challenge I see is the challenge of if we have, of, with regulatory issues, if we have the UK, you, you just mentioned David, the UK yesterday just did approve and quickly we are thinking next week they're going to start vaccinating. How soon can the, the rest of the world do this? We know that for some countries, even with the WHO approval for emergency use listing, they still say that doesn't matter. We still, we know India needs to go through their own processes, for example, before they do that. We know countries have accepted to have agreed to have that um, expedited approval, but how soon can they do it by UK way when we say the vaccine is now ready for shipment? Are they ready to receive that vaccine? We know that infodemics and vaccine hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy was uh, listed as one of the top 10 global threats to, uh, to uh, threats to global health last year. This has not changed. It's even worse because the COVID uh, vaccine, even the pandemic infodemic has been unprecedented. So we are giving this vaccine to people who are human beings that have choice. And how shall we deal with this? So we know the plans are in place, but we have seen what has happened. People, we've had a polio vaccine, a measles vaccine, vaccines that people know very well, but they say no to. Now we are talking of a vaccine that has come with so much controversy. And we expect uh, that this, we shall do a good job uh, when it comes to communication. The other thing is logistics not only for developing countries, if we are going for, we have vaccines with, a, with, different, uh, uh, with different characteristics, yes. We know discussions have started at the COVAX facility for the access to the, to the, uh, to, to the Pfizer vaccine. So we, not just the, 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 about the, the ultra cold chain, but also our roads, our infrastructure, the new uh, target populations that we are looking about uh, around. So are we ready to, to deal with all this? And then the other thing is uh, Gavi is, yes, the COVAX facility is providing the vaccines but countries need to cover the operational costs. Well, they've signed up for this. They want the vaccine, the vaccine will be available, but do they have enough funding? Has enough funding been put in place to cover these costs? Thank you very much, Debbie, and over to you. No, thanks, Fiona. Uh, you touched a little bit on cold chain, supply chain, and uh, that's perfect, Rose. I wonder, you know, we have heard a lot about supply chain issues in the news lately, uh, whether it's ultra cold chain or, or supply chain issues in general. Um, what do you see as the greatest obstacle to distribution, both from your perspective in Kenya, but perhaps even commenting about challenges across the region? Thank you, Deborah, and hi, everyone. So I think in terms of logistics, uh, the first challenge that we are going to have is the issue of target population. Our current immunization systems target the children, pregnant women, the adolescents, and now we are going to into a target population that is normally not part of our routine. We are looking at healthcare workers, we are looking at elderly people, we are looking at um, the people who are living with underlying comorbid, comorbid conditions. So routinely, we don't have these numbers. So it's something that we have to try and coordinate with the other districts in order to get the right numbers. Remember for supply chain, we need to forecast the right numbers for us to know how much vaccine to procure. So the first challenge I foresee is the challenge with the target population. This target population is 20% of the total population as compared to the target population that we normally vaccinate, which is around 4% of the target population. So this is five times the population that the EPI programs handle on an annual basis. The second challenge I foresee is when it comes to storage. So we, are, we always deal with 4% of the population. Right now, we've um, had a population which is five times more. And even with our routine immunization, we do have gaps when it comes to storage. So that, uh, from the national level to the sub-national level, up to the service delivery point, we do have gaps in cold chain capacity. 
So with the introduction of a new vaccine targeting a larger population, it means the gaps in terms of cold chain equipment is going to widen. So that's a second challenge. And then in addition, our cold chain capacity handles vaccines temperatures of between positive two to positive eight. So if you have temperatures outside this bracket, we take it to ultra low temperatures. It, what it means for countries, what it means for Kenya is that we either have to procure new cold chain equipment or hire new cold chain equipment for us to be able to distribute this huge number of vaccines. And again, the other challenge I foresee is in terms of security. Remember, COVID-19 pandemic is affecting everyone globally. And here we are in the country prioritizing some people over the other population. So what I foresee is that we'll need more human resource to provide security to the high valued commodities in addition to distribution of these commodities to the service delivery points. Thank you, over. No, really interesting. And even that last point about um, securities of commodities and, and uh, vaccine. So uh, turning to you, John, here, we know it's important to keep in mind the differences among regions, among countries and within countries. So one size doesn't fit all, but it'd be wonderful to hear from you, your thoughts on what kind of differences are most relevant uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa as we think about introduction of COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so in Sub-Saharan Africa, just as you said, there are unique differences in various countries, even within countries, there are differences in their capacity uh, at different locations. The major thing is the fact that most countries have got varied health system capacity. Some have got very weak health system capacity. Some are, I would say they are moderate. However, you know that because of these weak systems, it also reflects in staff capacity. So the staff's ability to be able to deliver even current interventions is quite a challenge for some of the countries. And so bringing on board this COVID vaccine is going to be another hell of a mountain that needs to be managed. Uh, we, we've all agreed that one major challenge, just as Rose said, was how we are going to leverage the existing uh, immunization system, which is much more child-centered, to begin to provide adult immunization services. That is a big challenge that needs to be addressed. Each country has got its own dynamics when it comes to that because uh, coverages for the existing antigens vary from place to place. One major issue that also brings a lot of differences is also the research capacity and safety and surveillance capacity in various countries. As Fiona indicated, this is a vaccine that has not yet been pre-qualified. And so it means that more than ever, it requires a lot of follow-up, a lot of uh, evaluation, and then careful analysis to ensure that all safety issues are being captured and followed up in order to be able to ensure that the population is assured and protected as much as practicable. And here we are that some of the countries do not even have, I would say their pharmacovigilance systems are so weak. Uh, to a greater extent, uh, WHO through the Afro platform is helping with the AVRF in order to be able to bring together and build some of these capacity. But there has, has been challenges. One other thing is about the different legislative systems and also the conflict in various parts of Africa. And so if you go to some countries like DRC where already besides the conflicts, infrastructure deficit makes terrain accessibility so difficult. So even where these resources are available, how to even deliver them to reach the individuals that need them is quite challenging. And so it's important that we understand all these differences and be able to ensure that each country has got its own unique strategy, that deployment will have to be done. Because at the end of the day, what we need to do, just as you said in your opening remarks, we need to ensure that there is equity. We need to ensure that the entire world population is protected as much as possible. 
because having any part of the world not protected creates bigger risk for the entire world. Uh, I always talk about this, uh, the Ebola situation. Initially, when there was that Ebola outbreak about two or three years in Africa, other parts of the world were not so enthused or were, didn't put the eye for so much onto it until they started importing cases to their countries. And so it's, and for now, COVID, we know how well it already, it's a pandemic anyway. And it's important that we put all hands on deck and we understand the unique systems that are in various countries to be able to see how best we come up with solutions that will work in these countries. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there are a number of challenges that you've heard here and some we probably don't even know yet uh, because we're waiting for those first vaccines really to start rolling out. But, you know, we think about numerous ones, the obvious ones around cold chain, but what about, uh, as you guys have mentioned, transportation, distribution, uh, security, um, how do we identify those target populations, as Rose said, making sure we can target them? This is an adult vaccination largely right now. We've done a lot of childhood vaccinations. In fact, it's one of the strongest health programs in many countries. And so now we're shooting for a different population and we have to make those inroads and create those uh, systems. And then you brought up regulatory challenges. Uh, policy challenges, these countries uh, still have to make decisions and um, th they have to get information as quickly as they can to try to make good decisions. And, and that's, that's sort of a global issue across the board. So tremendous, uh, tremendous obstacles and, and challenges that we face uh, coming through. I think maybe now just shifting gears a little bit um, to think about solutions and how what we've learned from the past might teach us a little bit about uh, the introduction of COVID-19 vaccine and maybe how there are things, places where we may have to innovate. So um, I'll start with you, Fiona, again. You have many years of experience in new vaccine introductions, uh, including from the HPV vaccine, um, where you had to identify distribution strategies for adolescent girls and women, you know, a new population um, and not the typical newborn child uh, immunization demographic. Are there lessons learned from that experience or others really that you think would be helpful to keep in mind with respect to a COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, thanks again, Debbie. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, we, we have we have the higher level things when we talk of the regula re regulatory and all that, but we have the stuff that must happen, even when we have the vaccine in the country. So one of the lessons we learned from HPV being a vaccine being given to a unique target population outside the rest was it is very important to define who your target population is. We can say the elderly, but who is the elderly? Is the, is the the people we call the elderly in Mauritius <laughs> cannot be the people we call the elderly in, in, in Ghana, for example. We're a country which has a, a huge percentage of their population above the age of 75. So we cannot, uh, so the country's defining, going to the granular definitions of, we are talking of health workers, who is a health worker? Or we are talking of social workers, who is a social care worker? Is it the person who acts in a home for the elderly? That is maybe very easy in the Western world, but when it comes to Africa, who is a social worker actually? So making sure we define the target population, we had issues with HPV where we said adolescent girls, but who is an adolescent girl? And if we say 10 year old girl, who is a 10 year old girl? Is it a girl who turns 10 years in 2020? Is it a girl who is actually already 10 by the time she, or else to run with three cohorts, a girl who is nine in 2020, a girl who is 10, and a girl who is 10 turning 11. So definition of the target population. Then again, communication, communication, and agreements at all levels on saying the same thing. This is our target population. It is frontline, for example, frontline healthcare workers, those working in health facilities, and we shall vaccinate in health facilities, or we shall have specific uh, in vaccinating health facilities, but we also have outreaches so that everybody's communication is the same. And then the same policy when it comes to 
communication with the outside world. Yes, this is what WHO said. This is what the partners are also saying. This is what the Ministry of Health is saying. This is what the trained vaccinators are also saying. This is our target population. This is how we shall give it. So two dose vaccine, for example, it is. So making sure that the communication is aligned throughout the different levels. And also then we also learned that a new any new vaccine introduction should be used to strengthen the immunization program because we have seen cases where new vaccine introduction takes away the focus from all the other vaccines and then takes the center stage. And then the rest of the immunization program suffers. So this is one of the things that is, might come with a COVID vaccine because that's what everybody's waiting for. Or we need extra cold chain, or we need ultra cold chain, or we need this and this, all the communication then ceases and we lose and we start seeing outbreaks just because we're introducing uh, a new vaccine. I'll, I'll hand over to you. David. No, I, I think your last point uh, is so critical, right? That it's everybody focuses in on one thing and uh, the rest can get left behind. And we certainly don't want to see that happen in this case because we have to keep the drum beating with um, measles and uh, polio and DTP and all the others too. So yeah, very, very good point. How do you really get it done? And at the same time, um, don't lose uh, traction and progress on the others. Well, so Rose, following on from Fiona's question, um, you also have a lot of experience with vaccine introduction in Kenya. And I'm wondering in particular, if you can shed some light on the types of partnerships uh, private or multilateral civil society, neighboring country governments, that kind of thing, that have proven to be successful? And which partnerships you think will be very critical to ensuring equitable distribution of uh, COVID-19 vaccine? Thank you, Deborah. So I think I'll talk a little bit on the partnerships that we've had in the past. So Kenya is one of the Gavi eligible countries and we do have get vaccines from Gavi uh, in a con we do co-finance co uh, childhood vaccines with Gavi and then in country we do have several partnerships that have that have been very critical when it comes to new vaccines introductions we do have the UN agencies the WHO and UNICEF we have the NGOs we have the religious organizations and also the um, CSOs within the country. So from the past new vaccines introductions, what we've learned from malaria vaccine introduction, HPV and meningitis A uh, campaigns that has been conducted in the country, community engagement is actually critical. So the community has to be aware why a vaccine is being introduced and they ask their questions for them to own up and show up to be vaccinated. So community engagement has been key in the past new vaccines introductions. So moving forward to COVID-19 vaccine introduction. So I think the partnerships that are still going to be key, Kenya is part of a global community. So we still have to be under the COVAX facility, the umbrella that supplies the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is a very important key partnership in Kenya. And then secondly, we do have a partner like World Bank, World Bank that is going to finance quite a chunk of the implementation costs. This will include uh, training, it will include buying commodities with injection devices. So World Bank is also another key uh, stakeholder in the country. Then World Bank and the COVAX facility, so we are going to be under this, we are going to be having the in-country partners. We have UNICEF, WHO, the religious organizations, the CSOs that are going to be very critical when it comes to introduction of the COVID-19 vaccines. So because again, Kenya is part of the East Africa community, I think we need to leverage on the different relationships we have with the East African community, Africa CDC, African Union, even as we introduce these vaccines. Remember, we are going to be given only 20% uh, of vaccines to cover the target population. So we may need to bridge that gap with these bilateral, bilateral engagements with 
within Africa and also with other organizations. Over. Thank you very much, Rose. Uh, really, really helpful. Um, just understanding the vast array of partnerships that um, we need in place. And that takes time and energy and resources too. And we just can't forget that um, as, as we go forward. So uh, John, really the last kind of uh, more formal question goes to you. And uh, it's really about the world's first malaria vaccine has been in pilot implementation uh, since spring of last year. Um, and so just wanting you to comment on which lessons or insights from this ongoing pilot introduction do you think are most helpful as we plan for the rollout of one or more COVID-19 vaccines? Yeah, thank you. I will again repeat what the other panelists have said. Being proactive in communication is very, very crucial. Ensuring that all stakeholders are brought on board and understanding what their uh, needs are and what their perspective on the vaccine introduction are is very, very important in order to be able to meet them to ensure that it's fully integrated. With COVID, one thing that has come to stay to a greater extent is also about digitize, uh, digitization, digital health. To a greater extent in the Malaya vaccine, one thing that we have tried to work with the ministries to be able to improve upon has been how we can uh, pilot digital platforms to be able to ensure that healthcare workers continue to receive support, especially continuous training and supportive supervision in areas where there are challenges in terms of access. And I'll say that in Ghana, one thing that is also that we are leveraging now has also been the availability of the medical drones. And uh, during the COVID period, we saw how useful that it could also be in terms of being able to deliver vaccines at areas where they are difficult. It's because when transportation became nearly impossible, we had to rely on these medical drones to be able to ensure that vaccines were delivered to some of the locations where it was just difficult to be able to assess. So I believe that harnessing all these things and improving upon it would ensure that at least we are able to reach the targeted population in, with COVID vaccine. And the average platform, as I indicated earlier on, has also helped, especially with other countries that have got weak and, uh, regulatory infrastructure. And with that, it's been able, it was able to bring together all these three countries so that the regulatory systems were able to uh, expeditedly review the protocols or the uh, necessary act activities that needed to be done. So it shortened the process by which these uh, vaccines need, needed to be uh, registered in these countries before the pilot introductions could take off. So I believe that these are things that we should be able to leverage and improve upon for this COVID vaccine as it's uh, coming on board. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, John. Yeah, it is nice. Some of these more recent examples are, are systems that are even set up now or recently that we can just uh, click into, like you said, sort of a regional regulatory effort um, to help countries with speed of, of regulatory approval for these vaccines. So all right, well, thank you panelists. We're gonna now shift to audience Q&A. We have a lot of great questions coming in for our audience and I wanna make sure we save time for them. So um, I'll dive in right away. Uh, the first question goes to, I'm thinking Rose, but you probably all have something to say about this. Um, so successful immunization programs also need to secure injection devices and manage the resulting waste. What planning is underway for this? And maybe Rose, if you, if you wanna take that, um, but also happy to have others chime in. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. So of course the vaccines don't come in isolation as standalone, the vaccines have to be accompanied by the safety boxes, the um, reconstitution syringes, the um, injection, injecting syringes. So these are going to be one, we are going to, as part of the funds that are being given locally by the local partners, we are going to procure this. But remember we do have uh, 47 counties, Kenya is devolved. So this is a shared responsibility between the national government and the county governments. So the counties are also going to chip in when it comes to purchasing of the other commodities related to 
the other supplies related to giving injections. Because again, as you are aware, injections are used in hospitals, they're used in immunizations. So it's going to be a full sort of arrangement where we are going to benefit as a country by pooling our resources in order to purchase the additional cold chain, uh, additional commodity supplies over. So Fiona or John, anything to add to that? Well, we are doing also uh, assessments on, uh, on, on all these capacity, different countries, and they're doing the self-assessments and telling us the gaps and partners with, as, 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 uh, as Rose mentioned, partners are coming in to help fill these gaps. So it all starts with the countries and making, we have given them templates and they're doing these uh, assessments and inventories to see where the gaps are and what can be done to fill in these gaps. Um, I'll move on to a second question. So uh, 2 billion people are estimated to have lost work uh, during this pandemic. Street vendors, recyclers, construction workers, transport workers, and some will become homeless. Any thoughts on how public health systems can track the homeless or migrants um, who've received vaccines? So this gets to, yeah the populations that are more difficult to track. Uh, and this is really to all of you. So uh, somebody chime in. Well, if I could start, uh, the World Bank is actually rolling out um, a, a, a something, a pilot project on how to get to these difficult and hard to reach populations that are not the typical that we're talking about. We know where to find healthcare workers. We do may not even know where to find the old people, especially in Africa, because they are not a population that normally is, 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 uh, is in one place. But then these special groups uh, that had to reach, how shall we track those who have been vaccinated and have moved around? Uh, definitely, like any other vaccine, we hope to give out a card, to hand out a card or something to show that you have been vaccinated and not only vaccinated, but with how many doses of the vaccine. And hopefully that the homeless that I mentioned can now be can be able to keep that card, but I think it's an excellent question and something that uh, should help us to to think better for, about some of these populations that we've not normally thought about. Thank you, yeah. Fiona. Anybody else? Yeah. So I yes, I think we can learn lessons from this issue about the urban, urban immunization challenge that most countries in Africa have, where it appears that the, a greater percentage of non-immunized children are normally found in urban slums, as it were. And uh, over the past few years, I know a lot of countries have undertaken research and studies to be able to identify these and then look at how best they can reach them with services. So some of these strategies should be leveraged on to be able to see how best we can reach the homeless in particular. Because they are moving around. And uh, just as Fiona said, we hope that they will be able to maintain these cards. But that also calls for close collaboration with the local authorities and also even with religious leaders. Because in Africa, most people are religious. So even if they are homeless, they will still identify with one religious organization or the other. How do we ensure that we leverage all those kind of relationships so that these religious leaders can also help us do some of this tracking to be able to ensure that everyone that needs to get the product is reached? Thank you. All right, well then uh, next question is around safety monitoring. Obviously it's key when new vaccines are introduced. What can we learn from other vaccine introductions around monitoring safety? I know people are concerned everywhere ab about how we do that. So uh, th this is a question to all the panelists. I can start with you, Fiona, because you've... <laughs> Got a big smile on your face, ready to answer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thanks, Debbie. Really, yeah, I know it's also another good question, but when it comes to safety, what we are doing again is countries are telling us what they have in place and having a solid pharmacovigilance uh, system is one of the requirements uh, before introduction of any new vaccine. And the countries, as they fill out the vaccine introduction readiness assessment tools, these are some of the questions that they are asked for 
and what and if there are any gaps they need to tell us and we are trying as much as possible partners immunization partners to try and fill these gaps as quickly as possible if it is training we are also planning surge capacity uh, the funding from COVAX to, sub, to support the TS funding from Gavi is to ensure that these countries have all this, especially for a vaccine where we are learning on the job, where we are learning, we are getting to know the details of the safety, uh, the safety profile of the vaccine while it's still ongoing. I know uh, John would have something more to say about this and Rose, when it, for example, what we are doing for the malaria vaccine, which is exactly the, the same thing. So. Uh, the pharmacovigilance systems need, uh, or need to be in order. If they are not in order, what are the gaps and how do we fill the gaps? The country needs, to, the countries tell us, but we also help them assess and see what we can do to fill these gaps. John or Rose, anything to add to that? Okay, so thank you. In addition to what Fiona has actually said, safety is an important aspect of every new vaccine introduction and COVID-19 vaccine introduction comes with its unique challenges. Most of the time before a vaccine is introduced in the lower and middle income countries, it's first of all have been introduced in Europe and we know something about the safety profile. But this is the first time that we are all going to be learning on the job. And I must admit that our vaccine of vigilant is not quite strengthened, but this is an opportunity for the country to strengthen the pharmacovigilance as it comes to the aspect of safety. And again, in addition, it would be important for the country. So for an example, we are participating in the, some clinical trials so as to generate local safety data and be able to apply it to that, uh, to project that to our local population. So I think that would be very important in this context, over. Yeah, just as the others have said, one key point that we need to keep in mind is that any vaccine that comes should be able to strengthen the system, and that includes the pharmacovigilance system. One key lesson that we've learned from the Malaya vaccine has been the fact that it has also led to improvement of the pharmacovigilance systems in these countries. And it has also strengthened the collaboration between the EPI and the regulatory authorities. In Ghana, for instance, the EPI and the regulatory authority have got a joint committee that reviews all safety uh, reports together. And so with that, they're able to share information uh, quickly. One other thing too is because of how uh, challenged some of these systems of reporting are, it's important we also look at uh, strategies that will be able to empower individuals to be able to report safety issues to a central point where it will be analyzed. Because you, you, you would agree that because of at times distances that people have to travel for the nearest facility, even when a mother goes home and there are signs and symptoms or there are any uh, untoward findings that a mother is having, being able to come back to the nearest facility at times is a little bit of a challenge. So if there is another alternative systems where individuals or community members can still report these safety uh, issues without necessarily coming to the facility, that could also help in order to be able to expedite and be able to collect some of these things uh, quickly. But to do that also means that these systems have to be very quite robust. One thing that needs to be strengthened a lot in order to be able to do this is to be able to ensure that communication infrastructure is also strengthened in Africa. Because uh, without that, it's also going to be difficult for it to be able to report some of these things expeditiously and to be able to provide feedback to the reporting units in order to be able to also ensure that people are aware of the final analysis or the findings that from whatever they reported. Because if they do not receive feedback, then they are also disillusioned and it demotivates them from continuously reporting some of these things. Thank you. No, nope. excellent, thank you. All right, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, one, one question that I think applies not just to Kenya here, but the question came in about Kenya, but um, how is COVID-19, the, the, the disease affecting current immunization programs um, in Kenya and countries like it, how can the countries continue strengthening their immunization programs to respond effectively to the pandemic? So this gets at the resource question Fiona was talking about, sucking resources and that kind of thing. So just maybe a, a comment from you, Rose, um, and then if, if the other two wanna comment, and then I think I'll try to fit in one more question before we get to closing remarks. 
So thank you, Debbie. So yes, indeed, COVID-19 has actually affected uh, uptake of immunization, uh, immunization services. We do remember initially in Kenya when we had our first case, we had to we had the stay at home directives, we had curfews in place, and this impacted on immunization since caregivers would not go to the hospitals, and then there was that initial fear of COVID-19. People might get COVID-19 are, are in hospitals, and then the immunization facilities were actually converted into COVID-19 isolation centers. But what we did quickly in order to reverse um, the low uptake of immunization services, we did have a task force to ensure that essential services are continuing. So immunization is one of the essential services that we had to make sure that uh, services are still continuing. So what we did is we did a communication to the health facilities on how to administer vaccine safely to the children uh, in line with the infection prevention and control guidelines. And then in addition to that, we did ensure that we have adequate supplies of vaccines, all the antigens so that mothers would get all those antigens at the service delivery points. And of course, yes, because of the issues of transitioning from Gavi, we still have those discussions with the Ministry of Finance. And even as we introduce new vaccines, even COVID-19, the discussions always revolve around, yes, we know that we're introducing new vaccines, but in 2027, we are going to be transiting out of Gavi support. So we've started those discussions and we are putting them into considerations, even as we introduce new vaccines, over. Thank you, Rose. Yep. Just to add on to what Rose has said, uh, in the African region, we saw definitely that the, the essential immunization was disrupted. We saw at least over 1 million children missing their third dose of pentavalent vaccine. About 850,000 children missed their first dose of measles. And uh, we saw many campaigns postponed. We saw many new vaccine introductions postponed and deprioritized. So really we need tailored strategies, tailored um, heavily thought through strategies to revamp immunization. The good thing with immunization is that uh, with the, all the new cohorts that come in, children can get vaccinated, but we have missed children. Who, the children have missed their doses. So tailored strategies like coming in with a intensified uh, immunization activities, more campaigns, catch-up campaigns, otherwise then we shall start seeing outbreaks that we did not plan for. Okay. All right. Well, there, I know there are a number of other questions in the chat. Um, we won't have uh, a chance to get to, but um, there are a lot of resources. So I'll, I'll tell you at the end there, but we'll um, make sure that you know uh, the, those participants on the call um, where you can go for more information about, um, about this, about COVID-19 introduction. So I just wanna give our panelists one last uh, opportunity for final shots. Um, one final message in sort of a minute or less. What would you like to leave our audience with today as we consider a COVID-19 vaccine rollout strategy? And so, um, let me start with John, if that's okay. okay. Thank you very much. What I just want to say is that we are in this together. So all hands must be on deck. We need to ensure that there's effective cross-border and cross-regional collaboration, sharing of resources and information, and hand-holding for those that are lagging behind. Otherwise, we are going to have a challenge with this pandemic, and we do not know what else it would lead us to. And so, we need to bring everybody on board and together we'll win the fight against this pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Rose, to you. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. So what I'd like to say is that we have different um, weapons in our arsenal to, to, um, to fight against COVID-19 and vaccines is just one of them. Even as we get vaccines available to us, I think it's just one of the weapons that we have to use in addition to hand washing, sanitizing, social distancing, and wearing a face mask. Thank you. 
Good. Thanks very much. And last but certainly not least, Fiona. Thanks again, Zembi. Uh, my parting shot is that uh, we are we all have a role to play, especially with the vaccines coming, a lot of infodemics surrounding the vaccines. We all have a role to play and we need to take it upon ourselves to get the right information, be informed and be the advocates out there and people to teach the population, the masters out there just don't know the right information. So there are about 125 people on this call. Just give the right information to people out there. You tell one person, they will tell another person. Let's break that chain of wrong information. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I just, I, first, I just, in closing, want to express my gratitude to our speakers uh, for sharing their time and expertise with us today. You guys have a vast amount of knowledge and years of experience that you've shared in just this little snapshot with us today. So thank you very much. Um, for those of you tuning in from around the world, uh, thank you for your engagement and thoughtful questions. I'm sorry we weren't, again, able to get to all of them. But uh, again, I also want to thank uh, ExxonMobil Foundation um, for their support. As we know, the corporate sector has an important role to play, not only in the development, but also in the rollout of COVID-19 and other vaccines. And we really appreciate your longstanding support of uh, past malaria vaccine initiative as well. And then finally, um, uh, whether PATH is new to you or you have followed our work for a long time, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, and I hope you'll continue to follow our series of webinar webinars and hear more from experts within and outside of PATH. So please stay in touch. Uh, and again, thank you very much for your time um, today and uh, hope you learned a little something. I know I did. So thank you again. Uh, have a good day, good afternoon and good night to all. Bye. <laughs>